there's that well, <coughs> well-trodden joke of the clergyman who said, this microphone is not working, and from the congregation came, and also with you. <laughs> um, um, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome <coughs> to the first lecture in our series, The Spiritual Senses and the Liturgical Arts, which, as you know, is part of this very exciting um, art, in wor- art of Worship project that is happening in the cathedral at the moment. It's an enormous uh, privilege and pleasure also for me to introduce James, who's our speaker this evening, although from now on he is Jim, I'm told. They were meant to laugh at that point, but nobody <laughs> did. It's an extraordinary funny audience we got in tonight. Anyway, um, it's a very great privilege to introduce Jim, who is an iconographer, a theologian, a writer, and indeed also an Anglican priest. And his subject tonight, the spiritual senses in tradition, seems to me enormously appropriate uh, for an audience within a cathedral precinct this evening, not least this cathedral, at, of course, which the relationship between the arts, liturgy, and worship have been extremely creative over the last few years. So, as you know, Jim is working with uh, Martin Earle here in the cathedral, and do stick your head around their little door in the north transept when you're passing. It really is fascinating to see what's going on there, but I'm not going to steal anybody's thunder now, except to say we have an hour, uh, And also, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end, uh, providing we don't overrun the hour. For those of us whose tummy rumbles after an hour, uh, you'll be glad to know we will not exceed that. So, mind you, it might become so fascinating we'll be here all night. Thank you. So, please, would you join with me in in, uh, welcoming Jim Blackstone to speak to us this evening. Thank you. Uh, great to be here, and th- thanks very much to you for coming here. Um, I want to give a few thanks as the first of a series that uh, really owes itself to the vision initially of the cathedral in the persons of the dean and chapter who are absent today. Uh, they're elsewhere, and so I want to, in their absence, but no less warmly, offer thanks to the dean and chapter, and in particular among them to the chancellor and the treasurer. I also want to thank the bishop and other trustees of the Bishop Otter Scholarship, which allows me to speak here and allows in part us, Martin, myself, and Aidan also is coming down this month, Aidan Hart from Shrewsbury, uh, to be here centred in uh, this cathedral in this town, in this city, until the end of next month. So my thanks also to Martin uh, and to Aidan. We work very much as a group and as friends as well as colleagues. It feels a little presumptuous straight off to be speaking on a subject about which Bishop Martin has already written. Here his book, Known to the Senses, has a wonderful section uh, near the end on colour and iconography on Andre Rublev and some poetry in there too. So I've been uh, inspired in reading that and other parts of the book. My own take, uh, not so much today but especially next time, will be based on the experience of working in the studio working with the materials. Uh, Today, uh, as I'll come to explain, um, we'll be focusing on the body uh, much more. But let me first, if I may, outline the project that we're engaged with uh, here in the cathedral. In these three months, we're doing two main pieces. One by Martin is a crucifix for the Bader College in Rome. One by me is of St. Dominic. I'll be mentioning him a bit today, which is for the clergy vestry here in the cathedral. This is a pilot towards the prospect of a permanent workshop in service to the church producing works of liturgical art. I'm going to say a little bit more about liturgical art and what that might mean uh, very shortly. So I just wanted to raise that hope on both sides of the cathedral and us uh, for the future. 
The outline of the lectures uh, is as written here. I've mentioned that next week will be more about making. The third week um, will make more sense, and I might mention it as I talk through the lecture of today. And hopefully at the end, um, and I don't want to go on for beyond uh, quarter two, certainly, um, possibly a little before, will be a matter of discussion, uh, not so much uh, questions or you know, questions, great discussion, preferable, um, so that we can share collectively uh, the creative ideas that we have uh, on this, this topic. I said I'd come on to say something a, bit, a little bit about liturgical art. Uh, as you see, the series title refers to the spiritual senses and liturgical art. And I don't want to presume that that's uh, universally understood, the word liturgical. Liturgy is simply public worship. And liturgical art is, as I present it, art that serves the core worship of the gathered Christian community. And as an Anglican, as Bruce mentioned, I understand the central elements of this worship to consist in the dominical sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist or illumination and intoxication as some of the early church theologians called them. So we find liturgical art throughout the whole of the sacred building, but especially at the font and most especially in the sanctuary around the altar. Now, to speak of liturgical art is not to judge other forms of art were they to be put in some form of hierarchy. Uh, I've mentioned Aidan already. He speaks of, from a Christian's perspective, gallery art, which is uh, what it says, threshold art, which is that art which speaks of faith, but without a particular concern for the dynamics of worship, and then also liturgical art. And these forms have different roles, different roles in those different contexts, and they must be judged according to those roles and contexts, I think, and not against one another. And, and that forms a principle that I will follow uh, through the uh, line of the argument of this lecture, which is in two parts. The first part argues for the role of the body in apprehending the divine. The second focuses on the particular transformation of the body in the processes of apprehending the divine, and it does so in the context of liturgical art. And I want to set up that whole argument of two parts by raising some questions in relation to our cathedral church's own liturgical art. And this uh, remarkable Romanesque relief now in the south wall was, as you may well know and much better than I, uh, once on a screen, most likely, and this according to the thinking of George Sarnetsky in the 1950s. It still seems to be accepted as far as I can tell today, but some may have uh, a corrective view on that. Uh, it was on a screen between the sanctuary and the north transept, and as such, is, although not quite so central now, is clearly a work of liturgical art. And here is a depiction then of Lazarus, friend of Jesus. He'd been dead four days, as we hear from the 11th chapter of the Gospel according to John. There was a stench, said Martha, his sister. She wept. Jesus wept. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus came out of the tomb, still bound, in part with strips of cloth. So this accounting of life, then death, and then life, new life, is thoroughly embodied in these various aspects. And those who see the resurrected Lazarus see a fully physical being. Jesus' own resurrection from the dead is different. For, and if we continue with John's Gospel, Mary Magdalene found nobody at all at the empty tomb. Nor is there any account of the departure of a soul from a body. The whole man, embodied soul and ensouled body, has gone. And indeed, from the beginning of his earthly life, through his crucifixion, through his resurrection, through his ascension, 
Jesus Christ is perceived as an embodied figure, transforming embodied figure, but an embodied figure. He's embodied, for example, as we know through the course of those transformations post-resurrection to eat fish uh, and eat bread at breakfast on the seashore in the company of his disciples. So crucially, a body, as we can say, the bodies have senses. And if physical bodies have physical senses, then spiritual bodies have spiritual senses. We'll come back to this after a consideration of how it is that the resurrected body can itself be seen. And if that's a question, the answer to that is not easily, it would seem. Christ's resurrection body is not easily recognized. We come back here to Mary Magdalene here in the cathedral's Mary Magdalene Chapel. Mary Magdalene thought Jesus, as you may well know and recognize, some of us may not, she recognized, she thought Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, to be a gardener. And were it not for Luke's account of Jesus on the road to Emmaus, where others struggled to recognize him in his presence as a resurrected body, we might think that she was simply disoriented by grief, as I've heard said several in the past. And she didn't recognize him till she, he said her name. On the road to Emmaus, they, the disciples, didn't recognize him until with him around the table he broke bread. Thomas didn't recognize his reality until, as we saw earlier in Caravaggio's depiction on Bishop Martin's book, until Thomas was invited to place his hand into Jesus' crucifixion wound. Now note that in his resurrected state, Jesus was still recognized through, again, embodied elements. The voice to Mary Magdalene, the food, wrote to Emmaus, the wound for Thomas. And indeed, his followers are very soon to eat his flesh and to drink his blood, as we heard Jesus challenge them earlier in the same gospel. Now, I repeatedly emphasize this sensed embodiment, mainly so as to ground the discussion of the spiritual senses in the resurrection accounts. Consideration of how it was that people saw the resurrected Jesus on earth forms a category that contemporary theologian Sarah Coakley has cited from another as belonging to what they call a too hard basket. Too hard basket. And that's our basket for this evening, if you like. It's a too hard basket, one that theolog theologians have often shied away from. How is it that people saw in different ways? And in quite mysterious ways, this body, which they recognized to be in continuity with that of the, the man they knew, knew before his death, Jesus of Nazareth. And we also look at the resurrection because at the heart of Christian faith and worship, it provides a case, it provides the ground for an art that depicts human embodiment. And close of you for those not so familiar with it of Grand Sutherland's piece where Christ is saying to Mary Magdalene to refrain from touching him sense being that he has a journey yet to cover now this position on depicting human embodiment has often been open to challenge and notoriously so in what's become known as the iconoclast controversy or controversy of the 8th and 9th centuries. Iconoclast simply means image breaking or image destroying. Although it was the iconophiles, the lover of images, the lovers of images, the friends of images who won out in this long conflict in the Empire of Byzantium. The iconoclast did not accept that the divine could be depicted. Jesus Christ was fully divine as he was fully human, established by that point. Therefore, he could not be depicted since he's beyond sensory categories. 
So what the iconoclasts produce, and you can see here, oh, this is in the top coffee palace now as it is in Istanbul. Uh, I'll stay them near the mic. Um, what, this, what they produced was such as this, a simple cross. Here, you can see it's beautifully formed, the tesserae of the mosaic, to form a straight line, albeit made within the curved apse uh, at the east end of the building. It's a closer view of it. Typically, iconoclast view, uh, unembodied, no uh, Christ embodied on the cross, no other figures around it. There's gold uh, and the symbol. And I thank Martin for this reference as we discussed uh, what I was going to say uh, tonight. Now, here's uh, another reference from Byzantium. Here is the Church of Domitian uh, in Nicaea. What happened here was that the mosaicists made a image, an image of Christ uh, in his mother, in the lap of his mother, then destroyed by the iconoclasts who made the cross marked out in pink behind her, then replaced subsequently when the iconophiles won the argument in the mid-9th century. Uh, this remained in place, the Virgin and Child, for uh, over a thousand years until it was destroyed in 1922. The arguments of this period were very complex, very interesting, very complex. But here's uh, an influential summary by John of Damascus, who spent his time is from his name in Syria, and therefore much uh, outside the bounds of the immediacy of the debates. He says this, and this is written above one of the doors Again, Bruce mentioned earlier, if you get a chance to look into them, it'd be great. But after one of the doors of our workshop in the north transept, these words from John of Damascus, he says, I do not worship matter. I worship the creator of matter, who became matter for my sake, who willed to take his abode in matter, who worked out my salvation through matter. Never will I cease honoring the matter which wrought my salvation. I honour it, but not as God, who worked out my salvation through matter, he says. And this is resonant with what we've been hearing of the resurrection accounts. And there's a little uh, alternative view of the positioning of the cross came and went over the course of these debates. So now back to our cathedral church. It's a really beautiful tapestry at the shrine of St. Richard of Chichester, shows a central cross amidst a number of kaleidoscopically rendered symbols, but no human figure. So the question is, as from tradition, and this being the tradition, the shared inheritance of the church, which all churches at that point for pre-schism shared at the time of the iconoclastic controversies, the tradition raises the question, what then of Christ's flesh and then what then of ours? That flesh in which Christian salvation is worked out. And what of the integrated figure? The embodied figure, the besold figure, the united figure, the unfragmented figure. Now I ask these questions not to present a personal view. And certainly not a personal distaste about a tremendous work of art. And made in part by students from West Dean College, as a number will know it. Yeah, sure. As I say, I ask these questions because I think the tradition asks these questions. And I think that these questions then at least deserve considered responses. And perhaps we might come back to these on any particular piece in discussion. And by the way, I haven't forgotten, closer view, this panel icon. I'll come back to that later, in fact, at the end. That's the, uh, for those who can't quite see from your position, now placed uh, in this remarkably strong casing. Uh, that's a panel icon of St. Richard of Chichester by his shrine. And then to the tapestry at the high altar, the sacred centre of the church. And I've read that the Tau, the T-shape of the cross, was chosen for historical authenticity. And yet that figure within human history upon the cross is not figured, is not shown. And perhaps it's interesting also if we come later 
to discuss this piece, to discuss this particular depiction of the Holy Trinity. Here in the form of Father in the disc, mentioned the cross in the form of the Tao, the spirit as a flame. And also uh, the triangle behind seemingly united them. Uh, it would distract to go further into that here, but it would be interesting to pick up on. We are anyway here in this tapestry at some distance from this embodied saviour. And the stakes here aren't simply aesthetic, and then they might not be aesthetic at all. The issue here, what is at stake, I think, and I would want to argue, and I do argue here, is how we understand ourselves as embodied beings. Now, a number of us might want to object that Christian tradition has not consistently maintained the value of the human body. And we might and might easily and perhaps tragically reference instances of the church's subjugation and abuse of others' as bodies as individuals, as communities in terms of gender and of age and of race. And this also might inform our discussion at any point. But within this general point, and my reason for raising it, is this. And I'd like to draw attention to a particular element of again, wonderful uh, work here. A statue Philip Jackson produced of St. Richard uh, at the turn of the millennium. I want to draw attention to a particular element of that sculpture, which is this. And I, Does anyone have an, in, an informed view before I speculate? as to what is being depicted uh, in this work form. And my, my monastic girdle, poverty, chastity, and obedience uh, there. I was wondering whether it could be related to a community with which Richard of Chichester had close dealings, the Dominicans. Now here is St. Dominic, Rich St. Richard's contemporary, uh, self-disciplining himself with a scourge, or he used iron um, by the account of this 13th century illustration. Uh, rope could also be used, wood could also be used, and was advocated uh, by Dominicans for some. St. Richard trained as a priest amongst Dominicans in Orléans, and his confessor, Ralph Bocking, was an English Dominican friar. Some of us here will know more uh, than I of the connections uh, so strong here. So one may suppose that St. Richard had good knowledge of at least the outward aspects of St. Dominic's prayer life. And we see such outward aspects in this Bolognese illustration here. Some 40 years after his death, it was produced. It's the 13th century. He died in 1221 at St. Dominic. So I briefly want to go through these nine elements of his outward uh, prayer life. Here he is bowing. And then he does so before the cross and the altar. Uh, here he is throwing himself down upon the out, uh, outstretched upon the ground. Second. Third, with a scourge. Fourth, kneeling, rising, kneeling, rising. Fifth, standing unsupported. Threefold repetition of his practice of standing continually. Arms forcibly outstretched. Reaching up and above. Reading often in the night hours. And here withdrawing from the company, going to the wilderness and take himself away for periods of silent meditation. So the body undergoes discipline uh, and a discipline of a varied and of a creative kind. Calling to mind some of the gestures of the Psalms as well as those in the life of Christ. We think of Gethsemane, uh, the crucifixion itself. Body, St. Dominic responds to the body of Christ. Sense response to sense. And so for St. Dominic, the body was an integral part of his participation in the life of his Lord. And we might then infer his notion of salvation itself. 
And I think this conclusion gains support when we consider that Dominic spent quite a bit of time in what's now the south of France, preaching against the Cathars, or otherwise the Albigensians. This powerful ascetic group preached a dualism between a perfected world of the spirit, on the one hand, and the entrapment of the spirit in material conditions, on the other hand. Matter, for the Cathars, was evil. It has been argued that St. Dominic's own rigorous asceticism was an attempt to gain the favour of a populace otherwise enthralled to the Cathar, Cathar prowess in asceticism. But whether or not that's true, St. Dominic's physical self-discipline clearly didn't entail a reject rejection of the material world. That was precisely what he was arguing against in the south of France. And I wonder if we can make some kind of loose analogy here with the way in which our culture features these two aspects, uh, one of asceticism and two of uh, denial of the body of some order. Uh, the first one is uh, burgeoning practice of intermittent fasting, or IF, to, to give it an acronym, it can be given, or the 5-2 diet, it's popularised in the UK by Michael Mosley. Uh, and here, in this case, studied uh, for evidence at Harvard. Again, note that this fasting, this self-discipline, need not entail a rejection of the body. In fact, perhaps precisely the opposite. It's an honouring, a valuing of the body and what the body can be. We have also... Uh, in our culture, too, some very high status according to the non-material uh, world, dualistically, surely, conceived. Uh, the CNN business correspondent here, this was back in December, described Zuckerberg's proposed uh, metaverse as a hard-to-define concept, referring to efforts to build a wide-ranging, and I quote here, to build a wide-ranging virtual realm that people can walk around within via digital avatars and interact with others who are also there virtually. There's no flesh here. Maybe it's not precisely anti-material, but it's hardly affirming of our enfleshed world. No matter in this hard-to-define metaverse matters, not because it's meaningfully integral part of the project, but only because matter does remain necessary in maintaining the virtual world in being. The internet itself uh, continues to depend upon tubes and cables. We know this recently from the crisis in Tonga. We know this because the head of the UK Armed Forces only last month was warning against Russian sub-attacks on the uh, Atlantic under sea cables. So here are just a couple of analogies to suggest the persistence of these uh, ideas and practices that we've engaged with uh, to this point in the times of St. Dominic and St. Richard. And this might also, I wonder, bring to mind the virtues of uh, online worship, Zoom worship, uh, that some of us might have experienced over the last months, and maybe that also a matter uh, for discussion. So th with this, we come to the end of the first part of the argument, and that I wanted to present, and that's an argument for the importance in the tradition of Christian faith of the body. In summary, the body is important because the word became flesh, because the word divinized the human body in the resurrection, made embodiment holy, made it integral to the everlasting being and health of humankind. The capacity to depict Christ was hotly contested, as we've seen early on. And I think those terms of the iconoclast debate as set out then remain relevant to the selection and making of liturgical art in our day. And finally, the body's importance is not in principle negated by the requirements of self-discipline in the life of prayer. So as we move on to the second part, 
by introduction, I want to offer some consideration of the transformation of the body in the context of liturgical art. And my approach here is pretty much in line with the theologians of the early centuries, which would say it's pretty unsystematic, uh, it's pretty idiosyncratic. There wasn't any doctrine of the spiritual senses, so-called, for over a millennium uh, until the scholastics of the early medieval period. And I want to go straight to the Song of Songs, and here we go to our origin of Alexandria, theologian of the second and third centuries. Origin's thought has been going on, undergoing a bit of rehabilitation in recent times, because uh, some of his thinking is close to Platonic mythology uh, and remain outside the core Christian tradition. But he proposed that three books in the Hebrew or the Old Testament, when considered in relation one to another, suggest the progression of a person towards the divine. These three books are Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs. Proverbs represents an ethical approach, the value of right action. Ecclesiastes represents a philosophical approach, the value of right thought. The Song of Songs is higher or deeper and represents a theological approach, the ultimate value of love. The Song of Songs as such communicates a fullness of divine human communion. If you're familiar with the Song of Songs, you'll know that this isn't at first how it sounds. It's love poetry. It's erotic poetry. It's beautiful. Now, Origen was quite aware of this, as was a man to follow soon after him, Gregory of Nyssa, who took on wholesale this assessment of the development from Proverbs for Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes to the Song of Songs. Now, for Gregory, the lover of the Song of Songs, who searches with a full heart for her bridegroom in the desert and in the city, is a type of the person, is a foresight of the person of Christian faith. And what she sees in her heart and what she comes to know with her body she fully shares in union with the bridegroom. And as St. Gregory says of the lover, in drawing near to the archetypal beauty, you too have become beautiful, informed like a mirror by my appearance. For in that it is transformed in accordance with the reflection of its choices, the human person is rightly likened to a mirror. Again, he writes, people receive in themselves the likeness of what they gaze upon intently. So the lover is transformed by the one she loves. Her whole being is transformed in accordance with the one whom she loves. Now Gregory, quite surprisingly, removes this gender articulation from the center of theology. At one point saying that the divine, the bridegroom, doesn't matter whether the bridegroom is male or female. You know, the gender categories aren't for him important as they may not be then for us. It's love that is the point. And it's a love that draws ever nearer to the beloved. Indeed, for Gregory, this is an everlasting movement precisely because the beloved is Christ himself, who is everlasting without end. And this kind of knowledge of the divine is knowledge that is within an intimate exchange. It's knowledge of life, knowledge of presence. It's not about inquiring. It's not from a distance. It's not about inquiring into the being of the divine. It's not about a concern with injunctions. And Gregory is thinking on this importance of the transformation of the physical life, even in this life may have been stimulated by the death of his siblings, two older siblings, Basil and Macrina. Macrina's death he was, he was close to, and it affected me. He was, she was an extraordinary uh, companion to him, and one with whom he discussed uh, his strongest uh, thought. This is an argument that Sarah Coakley's made. When he contemplated this then resurrection in the context of loss and of hope, and he thought then of resurrection not just as a post-mortem state, as he thought of his siblings, 
but as a transformational reality for this life on earth. So the resurrection of the body, of the senses, is now in the midst of all, in the midst of grief and of hurt. And this is an insight that liturgical art can and indeed must offer. But how? Well, firstly, liturgical art depicts love, and it depicts lovers. Liturgical art depicts a community of persons, persons being resurrected in love, transformed by the love of Christ, and increasingly transformed, as we heard of Gregory of Nyssa, by mirroring the one whom they love, which is the embodied saviour. Their love is total. It fills their senses. It fills their mind. It fills their will. The whole of their heart, the whole of their soul, the whole of their mind. It is the love of the saints. And the saints are recognised by the quality of their love. And these saints mirror Christ's resurrection love and light in their own transformed bodies. And we see here the transformed body of Richard of Chichester in the icon, so if we pick up on at the end. Here, highlighted with this light that stands slightly apart from the workings of the garment and yet still united with it. This sense of the transformed reality of the body of the saint. Same is true of his flesh, heightened in slightly abstracted to show the taking up of this person into the divine, remaining embodied, but infused, enlightened, illuminated, intoxicated with the divine. As we turn to look at the depiction of the saints in iconographic form, uh, we challenge to enter that same transformation that the resurrection offers. And I want to finish by offering some analysis of how this transformation might happen. There is a commonplace view that the icon acts as a kind of window, uh, a window through which there's a mutual gaze operating. Now, the person sees God through the icon and is seen by God through the icon. There, there's a trouble, I think there's a better way of looking at the icon than that, and I'll explain why, and I want to draw attention to the possible weaknesses of this way of looking that's the mutual gaze. Um, the main problem is that you're treating Christ as an object, amongst other objects. And because he's fully divine, he's not. So either one supposes that seeing Christ through the class, one is seeing a human person and no else. One is reducing the transcendence of the divine to any other human person. Or on the other hand, one thinks that one's being looked at by the divine. But in that case, you'd be obliterated as a person because the senses cannot sustain the view of the divine and be shattered. It was not possible to be other than blinded and destroyed by that option to see. So this mutual gaze is problematic. So I wonder if this works. Suppose then that the person who sees the icon is her or himself elevated through an inner transformation, to be unity with that which is seen. The point is, there's a transformation in the viewer. They're not simply looking with their physical eyes. And of course, this questions the very art itself, which is physical, it's matter. You know, it's what we're using every day. We know it. I'd spent ages trying to clean up after being in the workshop today. You know, it's, we're dealing with matter all the time. And yet, uh, here we find a challenge because the person who sees the icon in this transformed, elevated form is transformed such that the divine light has become visible to eyes that themselves become divine. It's like in the Transfiguration. The Peter, James, and John are given the capacity to see. You know, they don't see with their natural sight, it seems. This is the various homilies we can discuss these. It, the, the capacity for them to see is gifted. And I think it's an interesting question to wonder whether the sheep at the Transfiguration could have seen anything. Supposing there were sheep around, we might suppose there were. What would they have seen as Christ was blanched, uh, it was turned bright, luminescent before their eyes? 
Now, clearly the material icon is transcended at this point, and a contemporary writer, Charles Barber, has called it a moment of contesting the logic of painting, or escaping the logic of painting, or even the ruin of painting. The painting no longer has any purpose. The person is transformed beyond the requirement of the material vessel to communicate anything of the divine. They're within the divine. They're taken up into the divine. The material, materiality of the icon is at that point uh, dispensable. So it's a moment here where the beholder becomes subject to the subject of the painting rather than the painting itself. The moment when they open themselves up to the gift of spiritual seeing. And now this is the art of the font and of the altar, again, of illumination and intoxication. Its power is derived from the water and the spirit, from the flesh and the blood of Christ. Its art in service to the transformation of the world in love, emptying itself out as art before the one who empties himself out as Christ in an eternal spiral of ecstatic, Love, ecstatic, because one is always going outside of oneself in this experience. And that's where I wanted to end. I, so we've taken through from an assessment of the liturgical art, questions about the liturgical art in the cathedral church here, to an evaluation of embodiment as based on the resurrection central to worship in Christian life. Uh, to an attempt to discover quite how all that can be configured in the experience of liturgical art by looking at what might be happening for someone in the presence of Christ before an icon. Thank you very much. Jim, like St. Dominic, you've been standing up all the time, so do sit for a moment. Um, thank you so much for an absolutely fascinating and informative presentation. We are so fortunate, ladies and gentlemen, are we not just to be here and to have listened and watched this presentation. I'm particularly grateful to you, Jim, for your the way in which at the beginning you, you gave us different categories of religious art, the gallery arts, the religious art that isn't liturgical art, liturgical art. I found that extremely helpful. And um, I'm sure that my wife will agree with me that some of the mosaic pictures and old, uh, old uh, work you showed us from the medieval period reminds us very much of our four years when we lived in the middle of Rome. But thank you for taking us from the life and ministry of Christ to his resurrection, to the fathers, to St. Richard, and on even to the internet. We've covered a lot of ground. And if I may just finally say, before we move on, thank you so much for offering us tremendous insights into the art on our doorstep in the cathedral. Those of us who live with and see the works of art in Chichester Cathedral on a daily basis can so easily think we know a lot about it and even take it for granted. But my goodness me, you've opened our eyes and our minds and our hearts to so much more this evening about this place. Thank you so much.